We'll be talking about fruit here in Fort Bend County. Uh, real quick, my name is Boone Holliday. I'm one of the county extension agents with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension here in Fort Bend County. Yep. And uh, our offices are right at the end of this complex here. Um, we're here Monday through Friday. We've got uh, Texas Master Gardener uh, Research and Hotline members here uh, Monday through Friday in the mornings um, to help answer questions that you have. If you have uh, uh, some home gardening questions, if you need any um, advice on being a uh, sound and successful gardener in our area, come by and see us sometime. We also manage a, uh, a research demonstration garden out back, uh, about four acres of uh, themed demonstration gardens. Uh, those are open 24 seven. We just ask that you leave your uh, wine coolers and your beer cans and the trash can when you leave. Um, and don't heckle the other guests while you're here. Uh, so that's it. Uh, so my one job here this morning is to introduce our fantastic uh, superstar hero presenter of the day, Miss Deborah Birch. Yeah. And just real quick, I'll give you just a couple uh, points about Deborah. Uh, she earned her certification as a Texas Master Gardener here in Fort Bend County back in 2002. And she has since earned her advanced trained master gardener certifications or designations in citrus culture, home fruit, fruit production, and plant disease diagnostics. We call that first detector is the actual designation, but it's all about uh, helping people figure out what's causing problems with their plants at home. She is also an active leadership member of the Sugarland Garden Club and Beyond all this, she maintains an extensive home garden with an orchard of over 60 trees and vines, both in ground and in containers. And in her spare time, <laughs> she wrangles a small herd of longhorn cattle, a diversity of yard birds, and a few of the most pampered dogs in Fort Bend County. So, so here to share her experiential know-how in growing fruit at home, Ms. Deborah Birch. Too bad you didn't build me up too much. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about fruit trees. Today we're going to talk about um, being successful those first three years. If you get your fruit tree off to a good start, you will be able to uh, have less maintenance and less worry with it as time goes on. Trees that are stressed and have difficulty in the first three years of establishment tend to be weak and um, open to more disease than uh, those trees that are not. So, welcome. Today we're gonna talk a little bit about site selection, planting that tree, maintenance of the trees, and first though, we'll go over a few common terms. We're going to be talking about semi and subtropical plants. Now these are plants that like warm summers, low humidity, they can take some frost, but not freezes. The freezes will make them defoliate. So a lot of people think that they're deciduous plants like a fig, but they're not. They're evergreen or want to be evergreen. <laughs> And then we have the tropicals. They like warm, humid conditions, not hot. They don't like our summers particularly well, which means that tells you you're gonna to need to give them some afternoon shade. They are evergreen and they're in constant growth. And all of these tropicals grow here quite well if you just uh, uh, pay attention to site selection. And then we have our temperate fruit trees. Those are the ones that require a period of dormancy. They require chill hours in order to set fruit. So what are chill hours? Well, chill hours are just simply an accumulation of a minimum amount of numbers uh, before that tree will go into bud. They're expressed in chill units chill hours. It's calculated in about five different ways. A, 
and there were different chill requirements for different zones. So what is our zone? 400. We have, we require 400. So as far as accumulating the chill and what the, you don't really, that, all of that information and you don't really even need to use that because chill is either going to happen or it is not going to happen. But what you do need to know is that when you go to buy a fruit tree, you need to be within that 400 number. Within the 400 number. Now, uh, chill, of course, is not something that accumulates and just cuts off. Sometimes we have less and sometimes we have a bit more. So you could be safe buying anything from a 50 chill hour up to about a 500 chill. It means you will have fruit most years, but not every year. But you do not want to buy a fruit tree that requires 800 or even 700 or 600, because that means you will rarely have fruit because you have insufficient chill. So what does insufficient chill give us? Well, sparse, delayed development, the abnormal fruit that does form, it deteriorates pretty quickly, and you just, by and large, have an inferior yield. Now, another thing we'll talk about is rootstock. The majority of all of our fruit trees are grafted to a rootstock, so that root is not the same, uh, it's not the same apple tree that's on the top, okay? That's the two different types of trees. But we use rootstock for a lot of reasons. One reason is that it will um, determine uh, precocity, which means the tree's gonna mature earlier. If you plant a seed, that tree may not bear for 10 or 12 years. But if you by a grafted tree, you'll have fruit in two to three years. Yes. It also determines or helps determine fruit quality. So you can get a, a much better quality fruit. The rootstock that you have, they will bear fruit, but it is normally pretty awful. So you don't want that rootstock to grow. Also will help determine cold tolerance. It can add a little cold tolerance to your tree. Also helps that tree adapt to different soil types. It makes it more resistant to root diseases and pests. Also helps with pH. Now normally in Fort Bend County our pH runs from about 7 to 8.5. That 7 is con considered neutral but 8.5 is quite alkaline. Trees don't really like alkaline conditions, so we have rootstocks that will grow in alkaline in order to give you that nice uh, peach tree that you like. We'll also reduce the size of the tree. Some rootstock, like a, um, oh, let me see, like a flying dragon, flying dragon will reduce your citrus tree from a oh, 15 to 20 foot tree down to about a 10 foot tree, okay? Um, in the staying with citrus, the chorizo will reduce it by 25%. So instead of a 20 or 15, you have a 10 or 12 foot tree. Much more manageable for a backyard. They also will help in resistance to drought which is a very good thing. We just went through a drought and we have them every few years. All right, when we talk about rootstock, this is our tree, okay? This is our graft union. You see it right here, a little scar. The top of this is our um, mid-pride peach. Below it is our uh, citation rootstock. So this is then the root bark, and then this is where our roots begin. These are the first lateral roots. 
And that's important that when you put this in the ground, you want those lateral roots to be no more than two inches below soil. Because not only do they help anchor the tree, but they also uh, begin uh, oxygen and trees need oxygen. All right, so this is a typical way that uh, many trees are grafted. You take a bud, slip it into the cambium of your rootstock, wrap it up. After a while, it grows. You cut off the rootstock and your, uh, your tip, the bud that you grafted, begins to grow. And that's the tree that you are buying. It's important to be able to recognize your graft line. So this is one of them. You see that scar? Usually you can tell a difference by a scar. Sometimes the, the texture is of the bark is different. This is a wedge graft. This is a graft on a citrus. You can barely tell the difference, but it's there. There's a little difference between the texture. And this one though is obvious. Now, one of the reasons you need to be able to find your graft line is that you will make sure that any growth below it, such as this one, is removed. Because any fruit below it is not a good fruit. It will overtake your scion. It will take the nutrients, it will take uh, the sunshine, and it will kill off your tree. So it's not uncommon when people say, oh, I had such a sweet orange, and now it's just bitter and thorny. Well, that's because they let their rootstock grow. So always check your rootstock, remove anything below the rootstock. Another thing we'll talk about is cold hardiness. What has cold hardiness and what doesn't? So uh, this shows you that our average annual minimum for 8B, 9B, that's where 9A, we're somewhere in here, at 9A is 20 to 25 degrees. That's the accumulated minimum each year between 1976 and 2005. Anyone think that's changed? Yeah. Okay, well, I looked it up, and the lowest temperature between 2010 and 2021 is 23 degrees. So we're right on mark. We're right on mark. Uh, right here it was uh, 20 to 25, and our average now is 23. So it just seems like it changes, but, you know, we've always had that really bad weather. In fact, the, this is a picture of my Meyer lemon with that big ice storm we had, I think back in 2018, no, 2015. Yeah, so we've always had really bad weather and we've always had the opportunity to lose our citrus trees. All right, site selection, sun. Most trees need at least six hours of sun every day. Many of our trees do much better with afternoon shade. So if you can accomplish that, that's what you want to try to do. When you have your soil tested so you will know what your pH is, that's very important in what <coughs> nutrients you already have in your soil and what nutrients you need. Make sure that area has good drainage. None of these trees like to sit in wet ground. And give it space to grow. This tree you're gonna buy is gonna be small, looks so lost in the backyard, but in about five years, it's going to be really big. So make sure you give it room for air circulation and that you can get around it to do your maintenance. So, planting. When do we plant these things? Well, ever had this happen to you? 
This is a brand new tree. You can see the nursery tags are still on it. They took it home. They planted it. They removed all the grass like we tell them to do. They watered it really well. And just look at that. It looks awful. Well, newly, newly planted trees are subject to stress-related problems because of root loss. That's when you've planted it, you've torn some of the roots off. A lack of oxygen in the soil, low soil temperatures, and the fact that the plant was not hardened off. Fruit trees function with at least 10% oxygen in the soil. Tree failure caused by a lack of oxygen are due to waterlogged soil, compacted soil, or low soil temperatures. If your soil temperature is low, nothing's moving down there. The quicker the soil warms up, the quicker the roots will start growing. Transplant shock results in increased vulnerability for the tree's lifetime. So it's important that we treat them right at the very beginning. So what do we do? Well, temperate trees, those are apples, peaches, plums, pears. Um, you want to plant those in the fall and in the spring. But your semi-tropical and tropical, well, your semi-tropical, you really shouldn't plant until April. All trees should be hardened off before you plant them. Tropicals, really, keep them as a container plant or plant them in an extremely sheltered area. They do not like to be planted in the soil here. Concentrate on drainage. Full sun is best. Afternoon shade is very beneficial. Monitor your watering amount. Yes? Is that your tree? Is that my tree? The mango? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it was my tree. <laughs> I, uh, I do have a large orchard of about uh, 60, 65 plants. I have killed thousands. So, uh, experimentation, you know. So, what is hardening off? Well, hardening off is a process of gradually introducing that plant to your environment on a mild day, and I can just read all this, I can just tell you. Take that plant, put it under a tree where it gets dappled sunlight, leave it there for about a week. If it's gonna freeze again, bring it in. Don't leave it out there. This plant has started off as a very sheltered plant. It's been in, uh, you know, shaded, it gets the right amount of water, the right amount of food, it gets everything it needs. And now you're taking it and just throwing it out there. Give it some time. If we have really cold weather, don't plant it. The only one you would plant would be a bare root tree. Now, if you buy a tree, it has absolutely, you know, like a, let's say a peach tree again, has no leaves on it, nothing but a stick, you can go home and plant that immediately because that tree is still dormant. But it, if it is out of dormancy, you're going to want to harden it off before you put it out there. Or you can lose all of your leaves and any buds that are on it. So, harden it off. Put it under a shade tree. Let it just sit out there for a week or so. And uh, you can also determine where you're going to plant it by then by putting it in different places. But harden it off first. Once you decide where you want to put it, you're going to need to do a drainage test. Dig a hole 12 inches, fill it with water, let it drain, fill it with water, go away, 24 hours later, come back. If it's muddy or holding water, that is not a place to plant that tree. But if that's the only place you can plant it, you can still do that, but build it up. So make your bed above ground, a berm. Get topsoil, put your topsoil in, mix it in good with your um, soil that you have, raise it up, and then plant your tree. Soil test, 
This is a website you can go to and they'll tell you all about soil tests. Really, it, they're like 10 or $15. You should do it every five years. It tells you what nutrients you already have and what nutrients you need. Most soil in Fort Bend County is clay. Clay hangs on to nutrients. It has plenty of everything in there. The only thing it needs is nitrogen, and that's it. Okay, we're going to do, here we are on this beautiful day, and we're going to uh, walk us through planting uh, a tree. Now, the, the first planting is probably the most important thing you'll do because that's going to begin uh, the life of that tree. And the first three years are the most uh, difficult. So if you get through those three, three years, you're, you're good. Uh, the first thing you want to do is have your soil tested. That's really important. It costs virtually nothing, like, you know, $10. But have it tested, that's going to tell you what your pH is. It's going to tell you what nutrients you need and what nutrients you do not need. So that's going to help you with your fertilizer. And uh, after you have that done, you want to find an area, a site, go to your site, figure out where's the best place for your tree. And you do that by looking up. Or do you have any wires over your head? If you do, don't plant your tree there unless it's a dwarf or semi-dwarf. Otherwise, within five years, you'll be busy trying to trim it back and knock it back. The other thing you want to do is think about under the ground. Do you have any cable wires? Do you have irrigation? What's under there? And if you're, like I am, out in sort of a rural uh, area, you probably have a septic tank. And if you have a septic tank, remember, do not plant your fruit trees within the aerobic spray area. And if you have an old septic like I do, you have field lines. And so make sure you stay far away from those field lines because that's where those roots will go. You want to uh, dig a hole once you've decided you have a place that you can get at least six hours. You have plenty of room for that tree to grow and you have room to get around it to do maintenance. <clears throat> Dig a hole about 12 inches deep, fill it with water, let that water drain out, refill it, and come back in about 24 hours. If that hole is muddy, then you do not want to plant there, or if you still want to plant there, you're going to need to build a burrow. You're going to need to raise that area with some topsoil. And you want to raise it about 8 to 12 inches. And this will allow the water to drain off quicker and your roots will not sit in uh, mud. Once that's been done, then you can come out and uh, dig your hole. Now, we had some rain here about a week or so ago, so our soil is in very good shape. But I dug this hole uh, yesterday, and so it's a little dry. Uh, just wanted to demonstrate for you that in the center, we have a very firm area because once we plant our tree, we do not want it to sink down. One of the biggest issues a tree has is being planted too deeply. And when you plant it too deeply, you cut the oxygen off from those valuable feeder roots. So make sure you have a nice firm center. And then you want to dig a donut hole around that firm center. And this is the area where your uh, roots are going to grow. This is the tree we're going to plant today. Now, this is a loquat tree. And you can see I have other trees around me. And normally, you want to give your tree about 15 feet distance. But this is a small tree. All of the trees I have in this area are semi-dwarfs. They're going to be 15, uh, 18 feet maximum. So I'm confident that I can plant this tree a little closer than I normally would. This is a Genoa loquat. Loquat is a uh, Japanese plum. And this Genoa is a named brand that uh, is large and very juicy and has a good taste to it. This is also a loquat tree, and that's the uh, golden nugget. 
the golden nugget is uh, sort of a substitute for uh, a um, apricot. Yeah, kind of like an apricot. Not really sweet, not really sour, but it has good texture. And so this one is about three years old. And the one thing you'll notice on it is that it is uh, in blue. Now, when we get ready to take our tree out, we want to tip it on its side, give it a good shake, and bring it out. Remember, you're not uncorking a bottle, so you want to make sure uh, that you don't just grab it by the trunk and pull, because that can tear the feeder roots off of those first lateral roots. Here's our tree. And so this is what often you'll find. See those roots? that are already beginning to circle around. Those roots are not how we want them to be. Um, the other thing to remember is this is not soil. They're not, they're not planted in soil. They're planted in a uh, growing medium. And the growing medium is usually just wood chips of some sort. And um, we want to take that off. If we plant the tree in its entirety with the uh, planting medium, what's going to happen is we'll have a lot of differential drying and wetting. So the wood chips will dry out quicker and you'll need to water, but the soil around will absorb more and more water and eventually you're kind of sitting in a, a moat of uh, wetness. So we're going to gently remove this and to finish it up, we're going to stick it in a bucket of water and just agitate it a bit. You want to try to get off as much as you can, but you don't have to take the comb and uh, comb through it by any stretch of the imagination. So here we are. Here are our roots. Now those roots that were circling are now nice and, and straight. So we can come in. We're going to look at the center, make sure we don't have any big circling roots in here, because that can cause us a real problem. And this looks good. All right, we're going to pull these. That were, there we go. Now, don't be afraid of your roots. You don't want to break them off, but you don't want to be afraid of them either. And if you have some that are circling, that are larger roots like this, just cut them off. Your tree will be fine. These look good. All right, remember that platform we talked about? This is why we're going to use it. Put this tree down right here. Spread the roots out. There we go. Yep, spread our roots out. I'm going to check this height. And that looks like it might be a little high for us. So we're going to come in and take some of this top off. Yeah, now that looks much better. All right, we're going to move our roots out, move them out, and then I'm going to take some of this from the center, bring it up. to the tree. There we go. Let's see if I can get a little more soil moving. There we go. This is all the soil that came out of this hole, so um, you'll notice we're not adding any amendments. We are not um, adding any fertilizer. Uh, a fertilizer on a young tree like this can be very harmful. It can uh, burn the roots. So in goes more of the soil. There we 
speak up. All right, we've got about half of our soil in there. Now I'm going to water it in. Okay, and just take your time doing this. Uh, make sure the soil is nice and moist. have a little soil left over. You want to take that soil and just build a berm right around the outside area where you've dug your hole. There we go. There we are. Water it in again. The berm will catch the water and then over time will just collapse into the planting hole. Great. Lastly, what you want to do is you want to remove any nursery tags. Now, reason would tell you that these tags are plastic and they would uh, just pop when the tree becomes larger, but it's not true. Often, especially, there'll be one down at the bottom, and uh, they will girdle that tree. So do take any of the tags off. Now, another question might be, am I going to stake it? And the answer to that is, is no, I'm not going to stake this one. It doesn't really need it. Um, it's pretty uh, balanced from top to bottom and uh, it's in there pretty firmly, so we're gonna leave it. Trees need the wind to kind of bucket back and forth to strengthen that trunk. So now we set it up for watering. I like to use a hose. This is a drip hose, and I circle it in. You can just use stakes to stake it, you want to circle it around, not, not just the tree, but you want to circle it around the area where you've uh, been digging. You can use any type of stake to hold it in place. I even use bricks to hold it in place. You can hook up your water hose to this end, and then it will uh, drip and water the entire area and encourage the roots to move out. Uh, it's much better than uh, leaving it to your irrigation because the uh, amount of water needed to irrigate and keep a lawn green is not enough water for your tree. And uh, also it keeps you from having to remember to go water it. Another good instrument to use is a water meter. If you're unsure about watering it, these water meters are very nice. You can come out, stick it in the hole. Remember, you want the water to be about 8 to 12 inches. Stick it in the hole, and it's going to tell you if that area is dry or wet or moist. You want it to be moist, not dry and not wet. Now, normally, I would mulch this plant. If it were in the spring and summer, I would mulch from this about six inches away all the way out. But this is fall. We're moving into winter. And you want your, your uh, soil to be warm. You want uh, the sun to be down on it. And so uh, I do not mulch at this time of year. Um, I will mulch with leaves, as you can see, come uh, springtime. But right now, I want the sun to heat this soil up. And that's it. All right. All right. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh, what have you done 
important to try to keep fire heads off the Christmas tree? Ah, all right. <laughs> we'll answer that question uh, later, but right now we'll just move on. Yes? How much water are you giving it? Uh, that comes up next. <laughs> yes? I was just, just going to ask the same process for a pot versus the ground on the root ball? Yes. Remove all that when you're putting it in a pot? Okay, when you're growing in a pot, you want to use a soilless mix. Soilless mix. It's um, a sterile mix. It has no grass seeds. It has no diseases. It has no, um, you know, we have diseases in the soil, and they just need the right environment to, uh, to become a pest. So you want to use a soilless mix. So do you have to remove all of that? You don't have to remove all of that because what it is in is a soilless mix, okay? So no, you don't have to do that as long as you're using a, a sterile mix. All right. I have a question here. Uh-huh. I'm asking if you want to repeat the question. I think it's the answer in the back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, this is my first meeting. I'm, I'm very new to this, my friend, Steve, I planted one peach tree. Now I see I've made a mistake. The hole I'm digging for another fruit tree is in close proximity to a pecan tree. And so I, I'm gonna have to move it and uh, mm -hmm. I'll be happy to do that. The other thing is you're saying you only want two inches below the grass line? Grass. Uh, the, the lateral root. Uh, okay. That lateral root just no more than two inches below the soil, okay. the lateral root. Don't plant under pecan trees. They have cannon, and it has a fancy word, but basically it likes to kill anything around it. Okay, one last question. When you have the fruit tree in the container, you buy it, how long can you leave it in the container? We'll leave it forever. All right, you can leave it for a very long time. Now, we're going to rush ahead here because so much information. Um, save your questions. I'll be happy to stay afterwards and answer any of them. Watering. When you water a, an established tree, you want to look at your drip line and then you want to water a triangle because this is where your feeder roots are. Here, not here. So if you drag a hose up and put it right next, you're not watering anything. So you want to water out this way. You want, you need to know that the majority of feeder roots are in the top 12 inches of soil. Top 12 inches of soil. So you're not watering all the way, you know, to the core. You're gonna water just the top 12 inches. These are different ways you can water a newly planted tree. All right, how much water? One inch per week. One inch per week. Well, how much is one inch per week for heaven's sakes? Well, one inch per week, the math is going to take it in a four by eight area. Four by eight area, you need 20 gallons of water. Okay? 20 gallons of water. Put it down a couple of times a week, like 10 gallons and 10 gallons. Now, if you have clay soil, all right, clay soil uh, is going to uh, absorb water gravitationally. And so if you're putting your water in, in order to get down 12 <coughs> inches in, I'm sorry, sand, that's what I'm talking about, sandy soil, it takes 15 minutes of you holding that hose there to get your water 12 inches deep. If you have our lovely clay soil, for you to get that same 12 inches, it's going to take you two hours. Because clay soil is a capillary action. The, you've watered and the water just spreads, right? And then it starts going down because it goes air hole, air hole, air hole, all the way down like that. 
clay has, I mean, sand has lots of air, so you just hold it. It might be that big around the wet space and it's just going to go straight down. So, clay soil, you're going to need to think about watering long and slow. All right, now fertilizing. Why do we fertilize? We fertilize to promote growth. We want good growth from early in the season all the way through to our first frost. How do we do that? We're going to make sure our nutrients hit as many roots as possible. So that brings up the question of stakes. Do stakes work? No. If you put a one stake here and one stake here, remember those roots are not going to go, uh-oh, food's over there, and start growing that way. No, they're only going to take advantage of what is right there. So you either need to put a bazillion stakes or just do a broadcast. Should I use organic or synthetic? Organic fertilizers, and basically organic fertilizer just means it's made of an organic matter. And so the organic fertilizer, you broadcast them on the soil, the uh, microorganisms then begin to tear down, they eat that organic matter, whether it's leaves or whether it's uh, back guano, whatever you put down, even um, the, that rabbit food, the little alfalfa pellets, you can spread that out there. It's going to break it down and then the microorganisms feed the roots. Now, trees encourage them to um, feed them by giving them sugar. Just like grandkids. They'll be around you if you give them sugar. <laughs> Synthetic fertilizers, and, that, and this is their form, just feed the roots. They do not feed the organisms in the soil. Okay, so they just go directly to the roots and give them a boost, a big hit of growth. So what should our goals be? Well, with research and with learning, because 20 years ago when I became a master gardener, we didn't know squat about the microorganisms. I remember going to A&M for, for class and this professor was just beside herself that they were finally able to discover the benefits of microbes in the soil. So what we know now is that we need to build the soil to feed our plants. Feeding is best done by the microbial activity. And microbes will break down organic matter, releasing the nutrients to the plants, and the plants will feed them and encourage them to proliferate. So here's our little plant. You can see its roots. Those little nodes you see on the roots are uh, carbon, uh, collected, car uh, not carbon, collected nitrogen. This is microbes. Look at those little guys. And they're attaching itself to the roots. The roots are slipping on a little sugar, and they're growing more and more, breaking down more organic matter, breaking down the nutrients, and feeding those to the tree. Okay, so... But we're still going to, you know, some people still want to do a fertilizer. And if you do, this is what you need to, to know. This is our rule of thumb. First year, application of fertilizer, which is a salt, synthetic fertilizers or salts, they can harm a newly planted tree. They can harm it in several ways. The most obvious is that it can burn the roots. If you want to fertilize, make sure that tree has growth, not just leaves, but actual twig growth. That means the roots have established, so make sure it has twig growth. The second year, the second year, you're going to fertilize the tree, tree if the growth is vigorous. Okay? If it's vigorous, and you're going to do that not before May, and not after August the 15th. Okay. All right, what to feed? 
sandy soils. The best fertilizer for sandy soils is a 15-5-10. That's for fruit trees. You want to fertilize one pound per inch of trunk diameter per year of age up to 10 years. Okay, so you're not going to fertilize all of that at one time. You're going to do your math. Let's say you need to do two pounds of fertilizer. You're going to break that into three feedings, not one big feeding. If you have clay soils, loamy soils, the only nutrient, I'm going to just bet money on it for you, the only nutrient is nitrogen. So you could, should stick with like a 2100. Again, you'll do the one pound per inch of trunk diameter for every year of the tree up to 10 years. Okay? When to feed? Well, tropicals and semi-tropicals, don't feed them until the soil temperature is 60 to 80. And then you want to feed them in April, June, and October. If they are in a container, like I'm advising you to do, you're going to fertilize them as soon as you plant them. And you're going to fertilize them, or you're going to mix fertilizer in the soil, and it's going to be a time-released product like Osmocote. Osmocote releases very gradually. It releases with heat, so it won't release its fertilizer until the soil is warmed up. And then you want to follow the directions on the container. Some time releases every three months. Some time releases every six months. I do the every six months because I cannot remember anything. So six months, I can do that. And then for temperates, for your temperates, remember that's anything with a stone. Um, Valentines, mothers, and fathers. That's called a sweetheart schedule. Makes it easy to remember. All right. All right. Back in the day, we used to uh, make sure everyone did an initial pruning. That's where we cut the top off the fruit tree. And that's because we sold bare root trees, bare root. We don't suggest that anymore. Now, there's an exception to every single rule. The advantages of doing that initial pruning is that if the roots have been damaged, if you've torn them or, or something of that nature, then, yeah, you're going to want to cut the height of that tree down because it makes the tree work less hard to uh, begin to generate leaves. Or if you want to train it to an open vase, okay, or if you want to train it as an SBA, then you will cut it as soon as you plant it. The disadvantages is that all leaves make energy for those roots and you need as many leaves as you can possibly get when uh, you're wanting success for that tree. Okay. All right. Now we're going to get into the vegetables and fruits that we are offering at the sale, and we will discuss them and what we have. So avocado tree in a pot, it makes a very good container plant. This is a, a full grown, you can see, it gets pretty large. This is in flower. This is fruit. Avocados don't ripen on the tree. You have to remember what it says about this ripens at this month. Write it on your calendar. So let's say it's going to ripen in October. In October, you're going to go out, pull off an avocado, put it on your cabinet, and wait to see if it ripens. If it does not ripen, you're going to wait a week. Go and pull off another one, put it on there, and see if it ripens. So it's just a matter of trial and error, but they will not ripen on the tree. Oh, that's 
the avocado in most people's backyard. <laughs> All right, so they need protection for two to three years. Don't go out there and plant them in the ground right now. Keep them as a container plant. Put them under a shade tree. They will do great. With a little dapple sun, morning sun is really good. Don't give them any afternoon sun because they have no bark. That stem is as green and as fragile as can be. And it will definitely sunburn and scald and kill the plant. Oh, already said that. Not cold hardy. Now you're going to see on some of these descriptions we have that they're hardy down to 18 degrees. That is after they are five years old, not before. They prefer 6.5 to 7 pH. Now, we talked about that most of our yards are 7 to 8. Now, if yours is more, and you would learn this if you did a soil test, if it's up there more close, closely to the 8, your tree's going to struggle a bit, and another reason to keep it in a container. So, uh, there's always a controversy about uh, avocados and whether you need a type A and a type B in order to get blooms, which is very true in California. But we're not in California. We are in Texas, and we have possibly the craziest weather ever. So, just to make this really quick, the blossoms are hermaphrodites, all right? On the type A, they're going to open up as a female receptive to pollen, then she's going to close up, and then she's going to open up in that afternoon as a male. I know. So type B is the other way around. He's going to open up in the morning, and then going to close, and then open up as a female at night. Now this is all dependent on temperatures of being 70, all right? So the temperatures have to be above 70, 70 degrees, night and morning. Let's see, I have one. All right, avocados bloom January through March. In California, they have temperatures above 70, that means that those flowers are working like clockwork. What is our temperature? Well, our average range is uh, 70 to below 70. January, our normal is 43 to 63. February is 47 to 66. March is 53 to 73. So our trees don't know what's up. <laughs> they are confused and will basically just stay open. So in Texas, in Texas, avocados are self-fertile. You don't need an A and a B. Even getting to thinking you'll have more, no, you're just gonna have self-fertile tree. All right, we have four, we have five, but these are four of them. Uh, the Arizona, Mexico La Grande, the lila and joey, all high quality fruit. Now you can see the difference. This one is elongated. It has a nice uh, neck on it with lots of flesh. Uh, Mexico La Grande actually is, is a good hardy tree. It does have a bit larger seed to flesh ratio. This is joey. Joey's always a workhorse for us. And this is the Arizona. Arizona does really well in heat and it does well in dry temperatures. The new one on the block is called the ooh la la. It's also called super hoss. Uh, and it was developed um, to be a sister to the hoss avocado that everyone buys in the grocery store. That's what you have in the grocery store. You see the seed and flesh, good ratio. It's a dwarf tree, so it's only going to get to be about eight feet. Again, would make it excellent for a container plant. And the fruit can be quite large, reaching uh, almost a pound per fruit. That's not going to be the first year. 
<laughs> Got to tell you that. <laughs> All right, figs. We have a number of figs that are very good. They're self-fruitful. You can see, again, a good container plant or goes right in the ground. These are our varieties. We have Celeste Brown Turkey, Texas Herba Berry, also called Ramsey. Little Ruby, she's a dwarf. And uh, the fruit in Little Ruby is a little more concentrated, a little less water in it. And uh, it's really tasty. Uh, Louisiana Gold is an open eye. And so those people that wanted to buy for butterflies, this is a good one for those butterflies. And the purple is a closed eye. The Louisiana figs can get quite large, quite large. They're really um, very tasty. Brown turkey, you can't, I mean, brown turkey is, is it. Everbearing is a, a good, very good uh, fig. The uh, Celeste, they're all good. You can't go wrong with any of the figs on that list. Open eye, closed eye. When I say that, I mean this is an open eye and this is a closed eye. All right. The open eye that we have here is um, the uh, Louisiana Gold, and she will put a, uh, a spot of sap in that eye in order to, to close it up for you. All right. Now, the Moringa, we sell this every year. This is the most fascinating plant. You can see nutritionally, this is based on a fourth of a cup. So a fourth of a cup of uh, Moringa leaves has more iron than spinach. Has seven times the vitamin C of oranges, three times the potassium of bananas, four times the calcium of milk. It is an exceptional plant. Uh, it's a tree, and it will uh, freeze back and come back every year. It has uh, long seed pods called drumsticks, and uh, they're full of protein. It's just easy to grow. Bees love the uh, flowers. How do you use it? Well, those are all some good suggestions. You can plant it in a pot. It does great in the soil. Just put it in the ground and it's gonna grow. It doesn't care about soil. It grows everywhere from uh, Africa to China, and you name it, all the different soils, it can do it. Okay, olives. Olives are Mediterranean plants. They like um, a Mediterranean uh, weather, which is uh, mild winters and long dry summers. We don't have that. So what you're going to want to do is make sure you grow that olive on a berm. Build it up because we're going to have that wet winter like we always have. So just build it up and give it a nice dry foot. That's what it likes. Um, pomegranates. We love our pomegranates. They, too, are a Mediterranean climate. They do best with mild winters and long, warm, dry summers. The uh, hard-seeded variety is more cold-hardy than the soft seed, and that's usually how they're referred to as a soft seed or a hard seed. Um, the humid climate that we have can adversely affect the look of your pomegranate. It looks like that. Now, it's not, not a beauty, but it tastes the same. So the, the climate, the humidity we have is only going to affect the outside of your pomegranate. So if your pomegranate looks like that, do not panic. Everybody else's does too. So, uh, but inside, they're the same juicy and delicious pomegranate. We have the Kandahar. Uh, early, which is from Afghanistan, and uh, that is the one that you're going to see a lot of in the in the store. That is wonderful. Wonderful is grown for the uh, commercial also. 
Parfigana is from Turkmenistan. This one will win taste tests time and time again. It is really has a very uh, balanced flavor. And the Salavatsky is Russian, and uh, it's a very large, it's got deep pink apples, and it's a semi-soft, and it is the sweetest of all of them. Mm -hmm. And then we have the turmeric. Turmeric, uh, you get a bonus with this one, it has really pretty uh, blooms, but the root is what you're wanting to grow it for because that is a, a delicious spice. We have banana trees and we're growing the uh bringing the blue java it's also known as the ice cream banana it does not taste like ice cream so <laughs> don't don't even go there it has the texture of ice cream so once it's ripe it is very creamy when you eat it almost custard like um <laughs> it's a beautiful tree to grow this is what the seed pod looks like. It's a big purple pod that comes down and then these little petals peel off and you have tiny bananas and what looks like orchids uh, underneath. And so then it will finally grow into a stalk like this, which that's in California, not here. Uh, we have this, but they're not usually not as full as this because um, they're gonna bear fruit in the summer. Oh, I'll just show you. All right, let's talk about banana trees. Now, a lot of people have grown banana trees as ornamentals for a very long time. But if you're gonna grow them for fruit, all right, you need to know they are perennial herb. The pod, the fruiting pod, is really the 135th leaf of uninterrupted growth that comes out. They stop growing in any weather under 57 degrees. If you want to have fruit, you need to insulate this pseudo stem. So you need to insulate it when winter comes. Uh, it takes two to three months for the fruit to fill out. Now when the fruit is, is there, it's, it's thin, it's angular. As it grows, it'll get larger, but it stays very angular. You know it's right when it rounds off. You want to remove the mother once she has uh, born fruit because she will not bear again and she will die. But what you have left are your pups. Now, a lot of people say, cut those pups off. No, don't do that. Leave the pups. They like rich, fertile soils. They like mulch and organic matter. You get a bag of leaves, throw them in the middle of your grove. You get anything that's organic, throw it in there. It really, uh, it just loves it. Um, you can use slow release nitrogen and potassium. I don't, I just throw the organic matter in and they do great. They like steady warmth, not too hot, not too cold. They really are just, you know, Goldilocks uh, of the plant world. They like steady moisture. They like steady moisture, not only in the ground, but in the air. So this is a place that you'll want to use that oscillating sprinkler because they want their leaves to be wet. Most importantly, the most harmful element uh, besides a good freeze for banana trees is the wind, the wind. It can shred the leaves that slows down their uh, photosynthesis. So you want to let these pups grow so that they can be in a grove. They like the shelter of other banana trees. Generally, I have a kind of a large, well, it just got out of hand grove. And so the ones in the middle will produce for me. The ones on the outside take all the abuse. They get the cold, they get the wind, they get everything, but they're protecting the ones on the inside. All right, coffee. This is actually a beautiful, look at that bloom, a beautiful plant. It loves water, all right? So you're gonna need to put it. This is one of the few 
that you need to put it somewhere where it's going to have water and goodness, high humidity. It loves it. So, made for us. It's self-fertile. Dapple sunlight. You want something to grow under your oak trees, this would be something to consider. Guava. Guava is easy to grow. I, again, want to recommend keep it in the pot. Okay? You get, uh, you may think, oh, I'm not going to get as much guava. How much guava can you eat? <laughs> you have to ask yourself that because I get, you know, 20 guava off of this, and they're all ripe at the same time, so I'm kind of done with the guava. All right, so they, they come in all sizes and all colors, but they're really quite good. They come in seedless and CD. So we have the white Asian seedless. It's a nice big fruit. It is seedless. The blooms, as you can see, are gorgeous. And then we have the Ruby Supreme, which I have. Now it has a wonderful taste, and they say it has seeds like strawberries, and I'm going to tell you, no. The seeds are a bit harder than strawberries, but you can crunch through them kind of like you would a uh, gritty pear, you know, an Asian pear with lots of grit in it, about the same. Papaya. All right, we sell the uh, Hawaiian strawberry. Has a dozen other names to it, but um, we'll do Hawaiian strawberry. <coughs> Keep them in a kid. You can plant them in the ground and use them as an annual. Uh, the best, when you plant them in the ground, make sure you have like a, a brick fence or something and facing south and you can plant them right there and you'll do pretty good. Otherwise, they are very sensitive to, to cold. Um, they like to be kept moist. They like to uh, feed a lot. Now, notice the growth pattern. We have this long petiole. Uh -huh. All the leaves and the fruit are going to be at the very top. So if you get a papaya and you take it home and the bottom leaves turn yellow and fall off every time a new leaf comes up, know that that's exactly what it's supposed to do. So don't be, don't be upset about that. Don't add more fertilizer, whatever you do. Okay, and they takes six to nine months for that fruit to ripen. Another reason to keep it in the pot, keep it in a sheltered area. You'll get blooms quicker, you'll get fruit, and then, uh, you're in hog heaven. It's a herbaceous plant. It can grow to be 30 feet tall. Ooh. The large leaves can be three feet in diameter. And remember that it, it is um, hollow. It's hollow. So winter's coming. You're like, mm -hmm, I'd like to keep that tree. You can come because you put it in the ground like I told you not to. And so you're going to come and cut it off. And it's hollow, so you're going to need to put a tin can on the top of it so it doesn't hold water. And then you can wrap it with burlap and all sorts of stuff. Just keep it completely wrapped. And generally, in the spring, take all that off and it will come up again and grow for you. It will come back again and again. Did that. All right. Male, female, or both. This is another one of those. So, um, plants tend to be either a male plant or a female plant or homophyditic, which means they have both on there. So the plants will produce more than one kind of flower at a time. Um, the homophyditis are preferred for home plantings, no kidding, but the most available in Texas are male or female, and that's because the Meridol, it's grown in Mexico. That's the one we have here the most, and those grow male and female. That's why we sell the Hawaiian, because the Hawaiian tends to be hermaphroditic more than the Meridol. The other thing to know about the difference is that the Meridol is a large papaya fruit, and it does take nine months to, um, uh, to ripen. Whereas the strawberry is small. It's a small papaya, 
takes four to six months to ripen, so you have a better chance of getting uh, uh, fruit from that. And the taste is completely different. The Maradol papaya is much different than the Hawaiian strawberry. The Hawaiian strawberry has almost a berry flavor to it. It's really, um, so they're completely different. If you've never tasted a strawberry papaya, you're gonna be surprised. All right, so <clears throat> to determine if a papaya is male or female before it blooms is not going to happen. There's, they look exactly the same. Once they bloom, though, you can look. This is what a female looks like, okay? Short stem. Here's your fruit. It's a little, little bud right there. There's your fruit, and then there's your flower. The males are all bunched together, <coughs> kind of like the guys do, you know, when they're hanging around. <laughs> and they're all over here, and they're bunched up on the, on the trunk, and they all bloom uh, a lot. So that's the difference, okay? Passion fruit. <coughs> I don't know how many of you have ever tried a passion fruit, but it is lovely. It looks not appetizing, but it is really, really tasty. Now, they're shallow rooted. This is the flower, beautiful flower. This is a ripe fruit. That's an unripe fruit. Those vines can grow up to 25 feet. And it's not one vine, it's many can grow up to 25 feet. So make sure you have a good trellis or support system for it. All right, we have to run over time. Um, all right, carambola, star fruit. They are best as a container plant. They will uh, do quite well. And the reason they're best for a container plant is they don't follow up, tolerate salt or high pH soils. Um, it's a crisp fruit. It's uh, delicious. They're best when they're ripened on the tree. Sugar apple, also called custard apple. It is the most widely grown uh, anona. It's uh, seedy, but the, uh, uh, the flesh part is custardy and sweet. This is one of the favorite fruits of the entire world but we rarely eat it. All right, uh, dragon fruit. This is our first time to grow uh, dragon fruits for you. So I wanted to show you, this is what the flower looks like. Now that's my hand. I have a big hand. So you can see that that is a really large flower. Now there are hundreds of named varieties of dragon fruits. They originated in the uh, Pacific uh, of uh, Central and South America. Um, their flowers bloom at night, and so they're normally pollinated with bats and um, moths. But the varieties now, the flowers tend to linger during the day. You can see it's daytime. So they'll bloom at night and then they'll linger through the day, which means they will attract more insects such as bees. Some are spineless and some have spines on them, which means they're really sticky. This is how um, a, a good way to grow it. You see these lines here? Though that's not wire, that's the tendrils of the cactus that grab a support. So this is a cactus that is not a cactus. So don't treat it, you're not gonna treat it like a cactus, it's different. So it's, you're gonna have a support system, it's gonna grab onto it, you let it grow up, you cut it off at the top, then you let the stems fall over, they will flower and they will fruit. Now, this is, this is the, the beginning. You can see here's a support pole and up here, normally you build a little square of two by fours. The support pole is, is like a four by four, two by fours up here. 
and that's where they're going to spill over. Most important thing I want you to notice is this. See that shade cloth? See that shade cloth? These are grown in full sun in Guatemala. And that's not our full sun. So you're going to have to give it afternoon shade or it will burn. This is, what, this is the name variety we're selling. This is Edgar's Baby. And they are delicious. They're kind of melon-like. We also have a variety that is an unknown variety. All right, they prefer full sun with afternoon shade. They grow best between 65 and 77. They like loose, rich soil. The pH is 6 to 7.5. You have to water it regularly. Don't let the water dry out. Again, oh, that's not a cactus, right? Don't treat it like a cactus. Um, you want to water your newly planted ones quite well and then make sure they get at least an inch of water all summer long. The stem sections form the aerial roots that I showed you that cling on to a structure. They can get to be 20 feet high, so you're going to want to Keep that pruned down. And after the root has formed, new vines will begin from the bottom. Cuttings produce in six to nine months if they're fertilized. And blooms are hermaphroditic but self-incompatible. So you have to have two varieties, not two plants of Edgar's baby but you need an Edgar's baby and somebody else, okay? Citrus fruit. I don't know, I've been waiting for citrus fruit. All right, we have grapefruit. We have our, uh, just the favorite, Rio Red. We also have Bloom Sweet. <laughs> Bloom Sweet is a heritage grapefruit in uh, Japan. It has a very balanced, sweet, tart taste. Tastes like a grapefruit should taste. It is seedy, though. <clears throat> Considered to be a little more cold hardy. Oro Blanco and Cocktail are both pomelos, and, or a pomelo hybrid, which means they have no uh, tartness. They're just sweet. We have Chandler Pomelo. Uh, it's, it, a pom if you've ever grown up, anyone ever seen a pomelo? Yes, they look like a medicine ball they used to throw around in gym class. They're big. They can weigh up to nine pounds. A lot of it is rind, but they are very tasty. Absolutely no tartness. They are sweet, sweet, sweet. All right, we have two lemons, two real lemons. Real lemons are not cold hardy. They are not cold hardy. And unless you want to um, replace them every few years, you really need to keep them as container plants. Um, they can reach up to 30 uh, by 25 canopies if they're in the ground in California. True lemons are not cold hardy. They must be planted in a protected spot or grown in a container. And then we have our hybrids. We have the New Zealand Lemonade, the Ujukitsu, and the Improved Meyer. Now, we all know that Improved Meyer. We love it. It's a um, hybrid, which means it's going to be more cold hardy. And we're selling it both as a standard plant and a dwarf this year. Ujukitsu is by far my favorite late season citrus. It's not even ripe until December and January, and it tastes just like a lemonade. You don't have to do anything to it. Just squeeze it, put some ice in it, or heat it up and sip it. It is so good. New Zealand lemonade is very low acid, so it has a lemonade taste, but no tartness. It's all sweet. For the limes, okay, the kefir, and the key lime are both true limes. The Palestinian sweet and the Persian are not limes, they're hybrids, but they are sweet, sweet. Persian is also called seedless lime, 
Bears lime and the Tahiti lime. It's a very good uh, lime. It, it's a cross between a key lime and a lemon. Palestinian is so sweet, sub-acid, you can just eat it as a citrus. Key lime, who likes gin? And, no, it's who likes key lime box? Thing to remember about these guys is that uh, limes, when they are ripened, they are not green. They are not green. They are yellow. They are sold green in the supermarket so that you will not confuse them with lemons <laughs> that are also yellow. But they need to be yellow. So if you have a tree, let them turn yellow. Key lime, if you buy a green key lime at the grocery store, I'm sure everyone's done that. You take it home and you squeeze it. You can use a hammer. You can do whatever. <laughs> You're going to get a drop of juice out of that. Once they're yellow, they are very juicy, very delicious. All right, limes must be protected. They make great container plants. Navel oranges. We have some of the best. Now this Washington navel uh, is the most enjoyed in the world, which means it's the most produced. Um, it's in the commercial business, and that's the one you're going to buy in most of the grocery stores. The N33 is absolutely delicious. We're selling it both as a standard and a dwarf. Cara Cara is also super delicious. Now, this says it has a hint of grapefruit. Not to me. Uh, this is the Cara Cara. To me, it has a, a little hint of raspberry in it. It is really a delicious, delicious orange. Now, the most important thing to remember about buying oranges, if you're looking for a juicing orange, do not buy a navel orange because the juice will react with oxygen and it makes it a metallic taste. So you can squeeze them on Monday and by Wednesday you can't drink it anymore. It's, it's got that turpentine taste to it. All right, but if you're looking for a juicing orange and an eating orange, this is your list. We have the Republic of Texas, absolutely one of the best juicing oranges. You can eat it out of hand too, but boy, you can juice it on Monday, and on Saturday, you still have a wonderful orange juice. It is very good. Pineapple doesn't taste like pineapple, but it doesn't taste like orange either. It has a very unique taste to it. Very sweet, we're selling it as a uh, dwarf. Hamlin, Hamlin is the one that you're gonna buy uh, in stores as those juicing oranges. The Hamlin and the Valencia are great juicing um, oranges. Very sweet, no tartness here. This is a Pomelo Mandarin, so it's also very sweet. We're selling it as a dwarf. And if this is the uh, Road Red Valencia. It's just a sport of, uh, or a mutation of the Valencia, so it has the same qualities. It just has a little redness to uh, the flesh. Okay, Mandarin. Been around a long time. And in all honesty, the big difference uh, in Mandarins is that they do a little better in cold weather. Now, uh, the ones we have for sale uh, this year is honey, which it is so sweet. It's really, really good. Kishu, top rated page is all the rage. Everyone wants a page because it's so good. And then we have Pixie. That's a little small one that you can call lunchbox clementines. But hold on to your... Self, the big seller is the Shiranui. All right, who likes, anyone had the Sumo orange, the Sumo mandarin? It's, oh my goodness. I went to HEB and they had all the oranges there. They had the, the Sumo and the Sumo is $3.98 a pound. Mm. Now, this is almost a meal in itself. They're full of fiber, or 
I don't want to say fiber because that maybe has a negative, but it's so delicious. You can sit down and eat it, and you're like, oh, man, that is that is great. It has a terrific flavor. It's a semi-dwarf tree nat naturally, and you can see it's a hybrid between a palm can and a keyote tangor, which is also a hybrid. So a lot of breeding has gone into this. This is one of the most highly in-demand mandarins around right now. Tangerines and clementines. All right, so <clears throat> they too are mandarin, but they need a little more heat to set fruit because they were hybridized in the Mediterranean. So they ripe in November, December, and January. Important thing to remember, delicious tangerines and, and mandarins are delicious, but they will flower, they will set fruit, and then they will shed all their fruit if they're not cross-pollinated. Only citrus that needs cross-pollinating is the tangerine clementine. So it will cross-pollinate with anything, any citrus, except navel orange or satsuma. So if you have a navel orange or a satsuma and you buy one of these, you're going to lose all of your fruit. But if you have a lemon or a Meyer lemon or a, a, a well, anything else, a, a juicing orange, it will uh, cross-pollinate with it. Um, the clementine is sold as a standard or a dwarf, and the dancing is a standard. All right, Satsuma. The interesting thing about Satsuma is that basically they're all alike. Little bit of sugar difference. Uh, what's really different is when they're ripe. You can see Awari, November, December. Sito is mid September. Brown Select, Silver Hill it is also uh, Awari. And then Shishan. All right, Satsumas. Remember that if you wait for them to turn completely orange, you're going to have an awful fruit on your hand. Satsumas are ripe when they're still green with just a flush of orange on them. Just a flush of orange. If you wait for them to be orange, the fruit will be puffy and the, and, uh, the skin will be puffy and the fruit will be dried out. Okay. So those, that, those are our fruit selections. I am very quickly going to go over our uh, quarantines. All right. We are in a quarantine for citrus canker and citrus greening. You should all learn the signs of both of them, and you can do so by going to this website. It's just the USDA. This will pop up. It will give you the history, signs and symptoms, the quarantine map, all of, all of the information that you need for reporting a disease. This is our citrus canker zone for Fort Bend County and um, the rest of our area. So this is 99, this is 59, and this is Beltway 8. So you can see it's a very large area. This is the um, quarantine zone for citrus greening. You can see very large area. So why am I telling you this? because our mothership at A&M wants to make sure that we know that citrus plants purchased in a quarantine zone must stay in the quarantine zone. So if you buy it here, just keep it within Fort Bend County, Harris County, Montgomery County, Chambers County and Brazoria. Okay? Don't go taking it to Williams or, or any other county, but keep it in those counties. Now, for <coughs> citrus canker, what they want to tell us is that, and I can't read it, so here I go. <coughs> it says, since there is no cure, and there is no cure, prevention is key. So you want to exclude the pathogen from any area by buying plants, budwood, or seedlings. 
okay? You don't want to bring anything in that has not been through a TDA certified nursery, which you will be getting, okay? Now, what is the regulation for TDA? The regulations for TDA on your nursery, it's important uh, that we know that as of 2019, all nurseries have to treat their citrus plants with a systemic drench 30 to 90 days before shipment, and then they have to be sprayed foliarly 14 days before shipment. The <clears throat> accepted insecticides are imidacloprid and clothinia. Now, those are neonicotinoids, and they are absorbed by the plant and dispersed through plant tissue, including pollen and nectar. Because they target the nerve <clears throat> impulses in insects, they are considered <clears throat> min minimally harmful to humans and mammals. And minimally always bothers me. <clears throat> However, the nicotinoids are toxic to bees. Not so much to the European bee, but very toxic to our native bees. And of course, other beneficial insects are affected by it. So um, both of these, the imidacloprid and the clothinian, are common ingredients in garden uh, insecticides. You get it in uh, most bare products and that type of thing. So, this ingredient can linger in the soil for months, even years, from where they can be picked up by the next season's plants. And the clover can remain active in flowers, shrubs, and trees for a year or more. The, the label will caution you not to use this product more than once a year. So, remove all your first fruits and blooms. If you grab a, <clears throat> a little um, orange tree and it's full of blooms, it's gonna break your heart, but when you take it home, get rid of those blooms. Because if you have any bees visiting, and they will visit because they're hungry right now, then they're going to be uh, killed. So, first year, take all those blooms off. If it has fruit on it, flip off the, the fruit. All right, I wanna thank you all for coming. The sale is next week. This is the hotline. You've been given a form like this. If you can, or if you don't have one, you can just scan that QR code and give people your opinion. <clears throat> now, turn your phones back on. I told you I would remind you. And uh, are there any questions? Ah, uh, yes, yes. What can we do about our very favorite, um, our insect at the stake, which is our fire ant? What you want to do for fire ants, um, you have to treat them aggressively. Uh, the one thing that uh, it's good to remember is that our fire ant has morphed. And it used to be one queen per nest. But now we're finding there are multiple queens per nest. So that means we have to be a little more aggressive. Um, Delimonine, uh, citric, cit, cit, now I'm tired of talking, citric acid, delimonine, D apostrophe L I M O N E N. Delimonene is toxic to fire ants. You can mix it with water and pour it into the nest and it will kill uh, the little buggers. You will have to do it multiple times. Basically with fire ants around your uh, citrus, any fruit tree, there are no uh, insecticides that are um, approved 
for uh, killing them. So you just want to irritate them a whole lot until they move. But the citric acid is toxic and will kill and won't kill all of them, but it'll kill enough of them that they will move on away from your fruit tree and then you can kill them by putting, um, oh, there's so many baits out there that are specifically for fire ants. And so uh, use those. Yes? Recommendation for peach tree. Okay, I will tell you. Um, you can't go wrong with the Pride series. Ava's Pride, Mid Pride. Those are delicious. They're free stone, uh, they're juicy. There's a real balance between sweet and tart. Ava is going to bloom early and bear early. August is going to bear late. My recommendation, because again, I'm lazy, I do the Eva or the Mid Pride because they bloom early enough that you're going to get less pressure from the plum curculio. By the time August is uh, blooming and, and bearing fruit, those plum curculio are out like crazy and uh, they will damage everything you have on the tree. Yes? Pear trees? A recommendation for pear tree? Well, that depends on what, what do you like in a pear? There, you have the gritty kind, you have the very soft kind. There's a lot of them. I will tell you one of the very best pear trees is the, um, I can see her name, she's not coming, uh, Acres Home. Acres Home and the Tennessee. Those are great pears. We have those. We used to have them growing back here. They are for sale, yes, and and I have some growing at home. Any other questions? Yes, back. Good question. Good. That's loud. Uh, good question. He said, if you have a plant in a container, do you just keep bumping it up and bumping it up as the tree grows? The answer to that is no. If you want to, yes. But why do you have it in a container? You have it in a container so that you can move it around, right? So never get a larger container than you are able to move around. That's usually 15 gallons. All right? Yes? Can you put the potted plants, uh, avocado, whatever, around the country in the pot? Or just... Yeah, in a pot. Don't put it. Don't put it in the ground. Yes. Your uh, your recommendation about organic uh, fertilizer.